Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a series on the book of Ephesians, which of course is a small book in the New Testament. Uh, this particular lesson is lesson number three in that series for July 15 of 2023, entitled The Power of the Exalted Jesus. Wow, that's an interesting title. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come recognizing our need for you in every discussion and our need for your, you and our understanding of these challenging ideas. Guide us in our discussions, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What does the exalted Jesus mean? Jim, can you tell? In the Bible study guide, human beings, it seems, are always reaching for more power Auto manufacturer Devil Motors, for example, showed the prototype of its Devel 16, a vehicle with 16 cylinders, 12.3 liter engine producing more than 5,000 horsepower. Or, if that is not enough, consider the Peterbilt semi truck that sports three Pratt and Whitney J34 6 48 jet engines, boasting 36,000 horsepower. And the truck does a quarter mile in 16.5 6. 6. seconds and regularly hits 376 miles per hour before deploying its two parachutes. Wow. In contrast, Paul prays that believers in Ephesus under temper, temptation. temptation to admire the various powers and deities of their culture will experience through the Holy Spirit the immensity of the power of God makes available to them in Christ. This divine power is not measured in horsepower or magic, but is seen in four cosmos-shifting salvation history events. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, his exaltation at the throne of God. Number three, all things being placed in subservience, sur excuse me, subservience to Christ and Christ being given to the church as its heads, Ephesians 1, 19 to 23 from the Bible Study Guide. Wow, that's a real mouthful, huh? Yes. Um, so what does all of that have to do with us, the resurrection of Jesus? Well, we know there were a lot of questions answered by that. His exaltation at the throne of God, is that possible for us at one sometime in the future? All beings be placed subservient to Christ, they already are, although you wouldn't know that on this earth, would you? And Christ being given to the church as its head. Carrie, you want to take on some of those verses for us? Yes. Uh, chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 19 through 23. And how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the death and seated him. No, nope, you skipped a line. Mighty strength. I skipped one. Sorry about that. Uh, where was I? Which he used when he raised Christ from... No, that was... Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, sorry. Which he used when he raised Christ from the death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. I'm, I'm going to interrupt for a second. We know the power of nuclear weapons. We know that you can take just a tiny little bit of matter and make an... Well, if you get it to break down produces you know, that M E equals MC squared uh, uh, formula. God took his power and crunched it down to make matter, and he made a whole universe. How much power did that take? More than 36,000 horsepower. <laughs> More than 36,000. Mentioned yeah. previously. Yeah. We read it in our last lesson, we read that all the, you know, all the power that the world has ever produced here on, on this earth, the, the people have produced on this world, is produced by the sun in about one second. Mm. <laughs> <Boy>. <laughs> and that's, and that's just one tiny little minuscule sun in the, in the, you know, in the huge universe. Mm. Okay, go ahead, Gary. Pick it up where it was. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers and lords. He has a little superior title. title. 
uh, where are we? Superior. Superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him self completes all things everywhere. That's from the okay. Bible Society, Holy Bible. Okay. Now let's think about that for just a moment. That God who did all that with all that power came down and was crunched into a baby inside of a woman's uterus. How did that happen? Well, we need to, we could stop. There's every few sentences, there are things you could talk about for a long time. Jennifer, go ahead. From the Bible study guide. After summarizing and praising God for his plan of salvation in Christ, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, assures his brothers and sisters in Ephesus that he is praying for them to continue to experience salvation through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Paul requests God the Father to give the Ephesians, one, the experience of knowing God through his revelation, two, the hope that emanates from God's calling and promises, and three, the faith through which they might experience the infinite power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's from Ephesians chapter 1, 17 to 19. Okay, now I'm going to check on you. Here's a, here's a quick quiz. Where is Paul writing from? Oh, uh, what? The jail where he ended up. Yes, well, a prison. He's in prison in Rome, yeah. waiting for his head to be cut off. Yeah. Now, he, he later managed to get out of, I'm sure by God's power, out of prison for a while. But I mean, there we, he was there at the whim of Nero, who was absolutely death on Christians. So, I mean, and he's writing this stuff. Mm. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Okay? Christ's power is manifested in two ways. First, we experience Christ's power through the, his resurrection. We are spiritually raised to the new life in Christ here and now and have the promise of the future final resurrection for eternal life. Now, he, Paul is going to suggest here, and I'm going to repeat this several times because this is a new idea to me, so maybe it is to you too. Paul is saying, when you are baptized into the church, you have taken the first step in this three-step process. One, you you're receive the Holy Spirit. Two, in, in the baptism, you join the church. Two, you will be exalted to heaven. And three, you will be seated at the throne of God. And he sees that as a three-part process, and we've only taken one step. Well... Second, we experience Christ's power through his ascension in that he is seated on the throne of the universe as God, our God, who blesses us from his heavenly places. That is, his heavenly sanctuary. Christ Jesus created the universe and all its physical and spiritual powers. Therefore, they are all subordinate to him. The rebellious spiritual powers that temporarily claim dominion over the earth are also subordinate to him. That's from our Bible study guide, page 39. Now, Thinking about this again, I want, us to, I want us to have a clear picture. He's writing to people whose background is to worship a whole host of different gods, all of whom are supposed to have good or bad powers of one kind or another. And he's saying, you people are talking about, you think you know about gods who have some kind of power. Let me tell you, God has real power. Okay? Paul was writing to friends and people he had not yet met in Asia Minor. He had, some, he had a number of friends there, no question about that. But there were a lot of people he had never met yet who, were, who were, had become Christians. He was writing from house arrest in Rome. In this section in Ephesians, Paul was focusing on three main themes as outlined in the Bible study guide. Duane, you want to jump in there? Uh, those three main themes are <coughs> prayers of praise and thanksgiving, are essential for the life of the Christian. Number two, for the Christian, experiencing the transformative power of Christ and the Holy Spirit in the Christian life is indispensable. And the third essential, 
as true Christians, by knowing and experience the power of Christ, we can freely live our lives in Him without fearing the rebellious powers of this world. Now, when I read this, I thought of some issues. We know of three times when the Holy Spirit was clearly poured out on church believers. And what happened? What was the first time? Oh, remember, nobody's afraid to talk up? Pentecost. Pentecost. Sure, absolutely. And what happened? Those people received the power from that time forward to speak any language they were communicating in perfectly, understand it, speak it, whatever like that. Wow. When, it, when was the next time we know in the Bible? This is not as familiar when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter himself said, this is just like what happened to us. The house Pentecost. of Cornelius. The house of Cornelius. Did those people, the whole family of Cornelius, have that ability as a result of that? Peter said it was just like Pentecost. There's one more time. We should know more about right here. It was poured out on some of the people in Ephesus. Do you know anybody who's able to speak an Indian language fluently whenever he wants to speak to anybody in Chinese and Japanese and Kiswahili and English and Spanish? And I know some people that speak multiple languages, but not every language. Yeah. I do one too. Yes. Well, is that what Paul's thinking about when he talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? I mean, he knew people that had happened to. Well, two of Paul's fairly lengthy prayers are recorded in the book of Ephesians. The first one is the one we are focusing on in this lesson, most of which we read earlier. So here's the next section. The next section is Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers, and I ask God, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know him. I ask that your minds be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promises to his people, and how very great is his power to work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right, his right side in the heavenly world. Now, it there you says go. there that he raised him up. Yeah. Well, other places it says Christ. The Bible says, if you take everything the Bible says um, and from the words of Jesus, etc., it's all, it's all three members. It says the Holy Spirit was involved. It says the Father was involved. And it says that Christ raised himself. So you can interpret all those the way you want. Okay. And how very great is his power to work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength. I read this already. He used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right side of the heaven, in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. And he has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. Good News Bible. Okay, there's considerable discussion among linguists about how you put all that language into up-to-date English. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. Paul's other prayer to compare with that one is found in Ephesians 3. Now, we're going to see that the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul is talking like this. And then the last three chapters of Ephesians, he's, talking about, he's going to talk about, okay, what do we need to do to demonstrate these crazy, powerful things that we've been talking about here. 
Okay. So, Gordon, you want to take on the parallel prayer? Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason I fall on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its true name. I ask God from the wealth of his glory to give you power over his spirit. Through his spirit. Through his spirit, to be strong in your inner selves. And I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, will, that you may have your roots and foundation in love so that you, together with all God's people, may have the power to understand how broad and long, how high and deep is Christ's love. We sing that song, Deep and Wide. Yeah. How may you come to know his, yes, you may come to know his love, although it can never be fully known, and so be completely filled with the very nature of God. Yeah, let me interrupt for a second. And Jim can, is going to tell us about knowing God. What does that do for you? Well, in John 17, it says it's eternal life. Exactly. To know God is eternal life. I mean, that's what more else do, what more do we need to say? Okay, go ahead. And then the doxology, to him who by means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of, to God be the glory in the church and in the and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. Amen. Good news. Okay. Bye. Paul was suggesting that we should always be in an attitude of prayer. And considering all that God has done for us, we should know that those prayers should be full of thanksgiving. We should live as if we are in con constant contact with divine leading. With God himself as our guide, we are not estranged. God is present with us. What do we call that when we say God is present with us? Emmanuel. Okay, Emmanuel is the, the name for it, but we, talk, we have a big long name for it, omnipresence. Yes, often we think of prayer as a kind of thing to say before we eat or before we go to bed. It's a kind of an add-on to our daily activities, but not for Paul. Prayer was central for Paul. It was even the primary task of Christian faith. I wonder how many Christians have tried to do that. Paul made very specific the role of the Holy Spirit in our prayers. How does the Holy Spirit affect us? Jerry? Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ and God put a stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people. And this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. Good news, Bible. Okay, do we talk about the seal of God sometimes? What's the seal of God? His stamp of ownership. His stamp of ownership, if we believe Ephesians. If we go to Revelation, it says the seal of God is what? Worshiping on the seventh day Sabbath, isn't it? As opposed to the mark of the beast. Yeah. The seal so, of the beast. Or the seal of the beast. It's, it's, it's the same word, it, mark or seal. Uh, what does it mean to say that the Holy Spirit is a stamp of ownership on us? I don't see anybody here with any kind of visible marks on them. <laughs> what does that mean? How is that a guarantee? Come on, we can speak up and raise some questions or talk. Well, that's the question that came to my mind. The Spirit is the guarantee, but... Yeah? Okay, what does the Spirit do for us? What's the main thing the Spirit has done for Christians, for Jews? Gives us the Bible. Gives us the Bible. That's exactly, he inspired the, the, the record. So without the Bible, where would we be? Lost. We would know nothing. We would know nothing. We'd know no more than Abraham did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but he, yeah. He, he had close personal <laughs> communion face yeah, to face. Exactly. You, I, I, whenever I think about that, I wonder, okay, what would that be like? We, we know one time God appeared like you know, walking down like an ordinary person, walking on dusty trails, and he, 
And Abraham says, well, come on, sit down, I'll give you some meat to eat. Mm -hmm. Veggie meat. I don't think it was veggie meat. <laughs> okay, well, as we know, Paul's life was full of opportunities and efforts to reach out to former Jews as well as to former pagans. To everyone and anyone who would listen, he would tell them about the love of God and about God's plan for their lives. He was constantly concerned about the progress of the churches that he had helped to start. Now, this letter is addressed to the, quote, Ephesians. That's a bit of a stretch because what we know is that Ephesus, which of course was the main center in Asia Minor, the biggest center of Asia Minor, became the, the publication center for the Christian church. So if you want, if you're a church, you want to start a church and you want some of the scriptures to be used in your church, what do you have to do? You have two choices. Either you pay for somebody else to write it out by hand or you go and write it out by hand yourself. Well, there were people who were pretty good at that kind of work in Ephesus, and so it became the publication center for uh, the Christian church. So when Paul sent this letter to Ephesus, uh, we discover in the oldest manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts we can find, the words in Ephesus are not there. Later, they were added, apparently, by somebody because this, the letter was originally sent to the Ephesians. So again, we had a, we're adding another piece to the whole puzzle of trying to understand this book. He is writing to probably at least a half a dozen, maybe a dozen churches that he has started all around in Asia Minor there. Think about the seven churches in, in, uh, mentioned in Revelation. And there are probably a number of other smaller churches and Paul probably had a significant part in helping to start all of those churches. So he's writing this letter to all of those churches, but he's writing it to Ephesus from prison, and he's asking someone there to sit down and write it out. So he's asking for publication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that Asia Minor that you mentioned, that's today Turkey. Western Turkey, yeah. Western Turkey. Remember that Paul grew up in Eastern Turkey. Tarsus was a part of what we would now call Turkey. So, so he says, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Jim, I'm thinking of you again. The knowledge of Jesus. What does it do for us? Eternal. Life eternal. There it is. Paul recognized that the people he was dealing with in and around Ephesus had their minds completely full of strange and bizarre things. The whole culture was oriented on activities in the temple of Artemis, Diana. So he is praying that their minds would be opened and their vision would be opened to realize how much better God's plan for them was. More than that, he wanted them to understand what incredible power God has exerted on their behalf. One, by raising Jesus from the dead, and every time I read that, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting too many, even myself too many times. What happens if you show up in a city like Ephesus, nobody's ever heard of Christianity at all, nobody knows anything about Jesus, and you say to them, I want to tell you a story about someone who raised himself from the dead. And they're going, huh? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, how? These guys were used to all these pagan things and so forth. How do you think they... I mean, what would you say to them to convince them that you were telling them the truth? Come on now, you don't try to tell us somebody raised himself. What? You know. Two, by exalting him to the heavens above, he, to be seated at the right hand of God. So not only did he raise himself from the dead, he has gone up to heaven. And uh, let's see here. His plan. And two, uh, that should be a three, his plan to do the same for each of us. Well, maybe that would get them excited. Yeah. Would you like a place in heaven? Jim, Ephesians 1, 4. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be ho holy and without fault before him from the Good News Bible. So if you want to believe the Bible, you have to believe that God has foreknowledge. Is it really possible that in advance 
God understood everything that was going to be involved in the plan of salvation and all that he would have to do during his time on this earth in order to save us? Can you imagine Jesus just before he condenses himself down into that little tiny baby, he says, yeah, I know exactly every step in the plan all the way through to the crucifixion and the resurrection. He knew about all of that. Well, he, well Hebrews 1 yeah. had many in various ways in the past he, he'd done it. Now he's going to do it this way. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, you, you couldn't reduce it down to anything less <laughs> and still get the message across. Okay, Kerry. Yes. Paul loves to quote things from the Old Testament. It's very likely that he had memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew from beginning to end. But, so he picks up three places he wants to talk about. Uh, here they are. Can you take those for us? Yeah. Uh, coming from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 29. Deuteronomy 32, 9 and Zechariah 2, 12. Deuteronomy 9, 29. After all, these are the people whom you chose to be your own and whom you brought out of Egypt by your great power and might. That's from the Good News Bible. Deuteronomy 32, 9. But Jacob's descendants he chose for himself. That's from the Good News Bible. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 2, 12. Once again, Judah will be the special possession of the Lord in his sacred land. And Jerusalem will be the city he loves most of all. That's from the Good News Bible. And if you read the Minor Prophets, it says repeatedly that Jerusalem is going to be, when well, we believe this from the, even from the New Testament, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, right? It's going to come down and the, this holy the Mount of Olives presumably is going to split and the new Jerusalem is going to set right down there. Wow. He then expanded that idea, Paul did, recognizing that God's plan of salvation was not going to be primarily carried out through the descendants of Jacob, but rather was to be expanded to be carried out by God's own people in the Christian church. Jennifer? Ephesians 1, verse 11. All things are done according to God's plan and decision. And God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose based on what he had decided from the very beginning, the Good News Bible. Now, it's interesting that both Paul and Peter use messages in the Old Testament that talks, talks about God's working with the Jewish people, and he says, now those things apply to you Christians. Mm -hmm. Do we recognize the importance and the incredible power involved in God's actions toward us every day? Do we realize that the Christian should live his or her life constantly aware of how each thought and every action are impacting God's plan for the salvation of his people? How much power does it take to raise someone from the dead? I'm not talking about CPR here. I'm not talking about, you know, some, something that happens in hospitals from time. That's just sort of a, you know, just a dip. We're talking about some, to raise somebody from the dead who is really dead. We don't have a clue. We do not have the begin. We do not even understand the first steps of that process. We do not understand how life was created in the beginning. We know that God did it. However, we have no idea how he did it. We certainly cannot duplicate the process no matter how hard we try. Back in 1952, two men spark, set a, a spark in a tube full of inorganic molecules and produced one, uh, not protein, one um, amino acid. And they said, we're almost there. We, have we haven't gone anywhere beyond that. That's, nobody from that time since has come close to putting into those things together to combine proteins and, and carbohydrates, not even close. Okay. The absolute astounding thing is that Christ Jesus, having died in the cross and having been buried in a tomb, was able to respond when his father sent Gabriel to call him. Jesus Christ in his own power came forth from the tomb to ascend back to his position of power in heaven. Dwayne? This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right side in the heavenly world. 
Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. Okay, so one way of understanding verse 23 there that sounds a little confusing is that who created all things? He was the beginning, wasn't he? And now, when it's all done, who's going to be the ruler of all things? Same person, right? Obviously, the resurrection of Christ is a major theme in the New Testament. His resurrection is a non-negotiable belief of the Christian faith. So let's talk a little bit about that. Myra? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 and 17. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. So that should give us a clue about what Paul preached about. <laughs> and how important he thought it was. Yeah. And if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is a delusion, and you are still lost in your sins. Good News Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death, as a guarantee that those who sleep in death will be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the raising from death comes by, me by means of a man. For just as all people die because of their union with a Adam, and in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. We each one will be raised in the right order, Christ first of all, then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. Good news, Bible. Okay, now Gordon, I'm going to ask you to start with the next verse. Now we're going to talk about it a little bit. Psalms 110, verse 11. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Okay. What's there to talk about about that? <laughs> yeah, simple, straightforward. Mm. Okay, anyone have any idea what that is? That is the most frequently quoted text in the New Testament, from the Old Testament. Why did they make such a big deal out of that? Well, now we said there are three steps that he's going to emphasize. The resurrection of Christ, then what? Exaltation. His ex ascension to heaven. And then finally, being seated at the right hand of God, right? So what does this talk about? The Lord said to my Lord. But why is that first Lord capitalized and the second one isn't? The capitalized Lord is Yahweh. Uh -huh. The non-capitalized is a person. Mm -hmm. In the Message Bible it says, the word of God to my Lord. Okay, well, the Lord said. Yeah, yeah exactly. So wh what's being suggested here is God is saying, Jesus, you are now a human being. Of course, you're also Christ, but you're a human being. Come up and sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That's quite a statement, isn't it? To take a human being to heaven, set him up, and Jesus, remember, he's, kept, he's going to keep his human form for the rest of eternity. He's identifying with us. Now the phrase, to put your enemies under your feet, sounds like it's almost a subservience, like mm -hmm. it's um, mm -hmm. stomping on them. Yes. I'm sure that isn't what's meant. What do you think it's meant? There's not going to be any threat to him, that's for sure. No. No, he's in charge. There's going to be no, I mean, what's going to, what's going to happen to his enemies? They're going to be ashes. They're, well, they're, uh, they'll be of no effect. Yeah. They're, they're not, they'll be in, become they're impotent. Going to, yeah, they're going, to, they're going to cease to exist. There won't be any enemies. No. So uh, yeah. <laughs> what's there to worry about? Yeah. And if everybody, 
exercise self-control, yeah. you, you well, don't need any laws, uh, rules or regulations, right? In, in Malachi 4, it says specifically that the wicked will be ashes under our feet. Okay, you want to take on the next one there? Ephesians 4, verses 8 to 11, as the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him. Mm -hmm. He gave gifts to people. What does it mean he took many captives with him? Go ahead and read the rest of that. <laughs> now, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who quote, gave gifts, end quote. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers in the Good okay. News Bible. Okay, so now what's he trying to say to us? He's saying this person who created everything and is going to end up being in charge of the whole universe wants you and you and you to work for him. Now, you know, we... If someone showed up right now and said, I am here representing the government of the United States of America, we would be respectful at least. We might disagree with them in some ways, but we'd be respectful. What happens when show, someone shows up and they are the king of the universe? Are we respectful? Why would, they need, why would the king of the universe need us? Well, I'll tell you why. You're talking about in the future or are you talking about now? Both. Okay, right now he needs us to to speak and represent the truth about him so that he can come back. But if he's all-powerful, he can do that himself. Well, he, yeah, that's very clear. He, he, he could have even sent his, the angels to do it all by himself. Right. He could have. So, but so is it for we, us? It, he, we need that experience. We need that experience of sharing with others. Okay, what are we going to do when we get to heaven? And even after that, we're going to spend time, at least some of our time, traveling around to visit the other beings in other worlds, explaining to them what it was like to experience salvation. So he, he's got a job for us. So it's a little bit like the drug addict who preaches in front of the church about how wonderful it is that he's come from down here to yeah. where he is. Yes. We're going to come from down here, the depths of sin, to... Yep. Somewhere better. That's right. Well, Psalm 110, verse 1, which we read just above, is the Old Testament passage which is most frequently quoted or referred to in the New Testament. Jesus was not just raised from the dead. He was also given authority over the entire universe, going forth to conquer all the evil forces that have been powerful in our world. And remember, these friends in Ephesus and in the other cities around there, they were deathly afraid of some of these so-called gods, some of these forces that were around them. So if you say, okay, here's someone who's in control of all those things, wow, you know? The people of Ephesus were co consumed with the idea of spirits and powers that might control their lives. Paul essentially told them, don't worry, if you're a Christian, you have connections to a power far above any of those. Ephesians 1.12 and Ephesians 2.2, Jerry? Um, I have Ephesians one twenty one. Correct. I'm sorry. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world. And the next, good news okay. Bible. You want to do all three? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Next is Ephesians two two. At that time, you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people. Who God who disobey God? I'm sorry, God, good news Bible, Ephesians six twelve, for we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. Good news Bible. Okay, now, I'm trying to paint the picture for you. These people would go to that temple of Artemis, that huge temple, four times as big as the Parthenon in Greece. Okay four times as big. And they believed that anything that happened inside of the confines of that building was spiritual and holy. I mean, fertility cult rites, and if you're a thief or a criminal, if you escape to that building, 
you couldn't be killed because anything that happens in that building is righteousness, right? That's what they believed. Now, Paul comes along and he says, you know about all these crazy things. You know about all these spirits and powers that you've been, they've been teaching you about. Let me tell you about the one who's superior to all of those. Now, my question for you is, how would he prove it? Would they just think Jesus was another one of those lined up gods out there? That's a risk. Yeah. There might have been some uh, logic going among some of the people, though. Yeah. You know, you, if you don't, you know, what, what were the competing ideas? You know, what we're ex ex exposed to nowadays with so many different yeah. media things. And, and you start it, but you're starting apparently rather young in the school. Uh, well, let me give you a clue. Minds. In Acts, we're going to talk about this later. In Acts, there's 16, I believe it is. There was a six. There were six sons of Shiva, who who was he claimed to be a Jewish high priest. We don't know exactly. Acts 19. Acts at 19. Okay, claims that they were. He was one of the high priests, and they came to this this evil man, this demon possessed man. They thought, and they tried to cast the demon out of him, and what happened? <laughs> <laughs> the demon possession man says, look, and they were trying to do it in the name of Paul and in the name of Christ. And he's, the demon possession man says, I know about Christ and I know about Paul, but who are you? <laughs> he attacked them, beat up on them, tore their clothes off of them. <laughs> that might give you a clue. <laughs> it's a starting argument. A very interesting, somewhat humorous story is recorded, and there it is. Um, I'll go ahead and read that. God was performing unusual miracles through Paul even handkerchiefs and aprons he had used were taken to those who were ill and these, their diseases were driven away and the evil spirits would go out of them. Now, if that was happening around, what kind of impact would that have? What if you could go up to the medical center here with a handful of those handkerchiefs? Yeah, you, you wonder how these religious icons get started. Some Jews, now my story, some Jews were traveling around and drove out all evil spirits, also tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus to do this. They said to the evil spirits, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Seven brothers, who were the sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva, were doing this. But the evil spirit said to them, I know Jesus, and I know about Paul, but you, who are you? <laughs> the man who had the evil spirit in him attacked them with such violence that he overpowered them all. They ran away from his house, wounded, and with their clothes torn off. All the Jews and Gentiles who lived in Ephesus heard about this. I mean, you know, a story like that would get around. They were all filled with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was given great honor. Many of the believers came publicly admitting and reveling what, revealing, I'm sorry, what they had done. Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burnt them in public. Remember what we said about how expensive it would be to produce a book? They added up the price of the books and the total came to 50,000 silver coins. In this powerful way, the word of the Lord kept spreading and growing stronger. So how much is one silver coin worth? A week's wages or a year's wages? A day's wages. A day's wage of a, of a for a working man. 50,000 days of labor. They burned them up because they said, obviously, no spirit or power or Lord or any of those other things come even close to what Paul is preaching to us. And they didn't want anybody else to read. No, exactly. Jim, I'm going to ask you to jump in there. From the Bible study guide, the overriding characteristic of the practice of magic throughout the Hellenistic world was, a, was the cognizance of a spirit world exercising the influence over virtually every aspect of life. The goal of the magician was to discern the helpful spirits from the harmful ones and learn the distinct operations of the, and the relative strengths and authority of the spirits. Through this knowledge, means could be constructed, that is, with spoken or written formulas, amulets, etc., for the manipulation of the spirits in the interest of the individual person. With the proper formula, a spirit-induced sickness could be cured, or a chariot race could be won. 
There's some okay. Clinton E. Arnold, Tower of Magic, the concept of power and efficiency. So they attributed everything that happened to these spirits in one way or another. He was a bad spirit or was it a good spirit? So God, Paul comes along and he's, you know, they're taking his handkerchiefs even and healing people. And he says, well, let me tell you about a power that's a little more powerful than what you're accustomed to. I mean, that's pretty potent medicine, I would say. The Ephesians believed in many different so-called gods and their ability to name and describe the work of those gods was presumed to give them power. Today, we do not believe in general that evil spirits have power over our lives, but are there any present-day manifestations that are really caused by evil forces? Yeah, be. How can we be, make sure that we are not caught, up, caught by them? Satan is controlling our world, and what does the Bible say? Satan is going to have more and more control, right? Yeah. Hmm. However, he uses many different methods. I mean, why wouldn't Satan use every method he could think of? Or even, even if somebody else thinks of it, he, could, he would use it if he has a chance. Music, the internet, social media, all are means that Satan uses to manipulate, especially the young people of our day. Try to imagine how it would impact your life if you had believed that everything you might have heard, I just heard on the news not long ago, states now are banning some of the most, what they regard as the most evil forms of social media. Whole states are banning them. Wow. So what, what if you, what if you could found what if you found out that Jesus is superior to all of them and that you could have a direct relationship with him God not only raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the highest position in heaven but he also designated him uh, to be the head of the Christian church Carrie reading from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 to 23. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. That's from the Good I will, Bible. I will have to say that in my early, my younger years, I thought, why does he have to talk like this? I mean, we all know that Jesus is superior to everything. What? What? And now I know <laughs> he's talking to the Ephesians like that. Put John 15, 15 with that. Sure. <laughs> it's a yeah. bit different point of view. How can we as Christians better understand the role that Christianity and Christ should play in our lives? Jennifer? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Be joyful always. Pray at all times. Be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life in union with Christ Jesus from the Good News Bible. Okay, these words found in the earliest book that we know about that Paul wrote are almost a summary of what we're studying in this lesson. Paul was joyful always. He prayed at all times. He was thankful for all that God had done. So what does it mean to say pray without ceasing? It means to think and act always under any every circumstances as if we are in the presence of Jesus Christ and why should we do that because we are yeah. it's true okay Duane from the writings of Ellen G White when Christ passed within the heavenly gates he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels as soon as this ceremony was completed the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over the, yeah, the anointed one over his people. Acts of the Apostles, 38 and 39. So how, how long was Pentecost after Passover when Christ was crucified? What does Pentecost mean? 50. 50. 50 days later is Pentecost. So Jesus went to heaven. 
He's enthroned. He did whatever he did. They welcomed him, etc. And when that was done, Ellen White says, the Holy Spirit was sent down and we had Pentecost and that incredible experience. Okay? Uh, Ellen G. White goes on to say, the Father's arms encircle his Son and the word is given. Let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1.6 with joy unutterable, rulers and principalities and powers acknowledge the supremacy of the Prince of Life. The angel hosts prostrate, prostrate themselves before him, while the glad shout, the, while the glad shouts fill the courts of heaven. Worthy is the Lamb that is slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing, Revelation 5, 12. And, oh, goes on. Songs of triumph mingle with the music from angel harps till heaven seems to overflow with joy and praise. Love has conquered, the lost is found. Heaven rings with voices of lofty strains proclaiming blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Revelation 5, 13. That's from Desire of Ages. Okay, we recently had a very nice um, musical program in our church here locally. And when I hear a nice musical program like that, I think, what would it be like to have 200, I just picked a number, 200,000 angels singing? With how many parts? I don't even know how many parts they would have. Unbelievable. Do we understand that Jesus Christ himself rose from the dead in his own power? He said he was going to. John 2 and John 18, I think it is. Then in cooperation with the Father, rose to a position of highest authority in heaven. Do we also understand that God wants to do the same thing for us? What implications does that have for our lives on a day-by-day -day basis? Revelation 4, 1 to 4, Revelation 5, 6 and 9 to 14, Revelation 15, 2, give us a little bit of a picture into what Jesus, who is called the Lamb, is doing in heaven right now. We, we don't have time to read those. We're just about out of time. In this study, we are introduced to an important method, important, yeah, important method that Paul uses in his writings. Uh, let me just summarize that real quickly. Those are Greek connection, connecting terms, which means, therefore, or something in favor of, or pleasure of, or so forth like that. We'll jump over that. In English translations, these phrases are translated as therefore, for this reason, something like that. Then he develops a therefore section. Paul first states and describes a theological reality of, or truth as a foundational section, and then he develops a therefore. In other words, that's the implications, that's the meaning of what he's trying to say. Paul progressively expands, develops, and enriches the horizon of his thought on the gospel, the church, and Christian life. In Ephesians 1, 11 to 14, Paul summarizes the essence of the gospel, the platform upon which he places his, for this reason, theology, and shows how the gospel relates to the church, which is comprised of saints. The Christians, are, or the saints, are those who have faith in Jesus, have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowing God, and have been enlightened to know Christ's calling, the inheritance he wants to give us, and this proper power of his resurrection. These saints are the church or Christ's body. This example of Paul's, for this reason, theology, is the essence of the church. Now, again, I want you to think, here are people who recently were pagans, and they have become Christians because they realize that the Christianity has a power they know nothing about. They, nothing, they've never seen anything like this before. And now Paul says, look, if you, if you believe this, this should be the implication of that. Paul was bringing to his Ephesian friends and also to the churches in the surrounding areas as they read and studied this letter from him, uh, the truth that the church is built upon God's revelation, not any human philosophy or idea about evil powers, the church is built strictly in God's power and his revelation. Paul gave a kind of summary of how a Christian should regard the philosophical ideas and positions of many of the world's leaders. 
Pardon? There's not much time left. Do you want to summarize this? Well, okay, we can do that. Paul just says to the Greeks, what I'm saying, at least when they first listened to it, just sounded like craziness. And the Jews, they just said, show us a proof, show us a proof, like this. And, and so um, it seems like this world's wisdom is just foolishness to God. Now remember what you were, my brothers and sisters, uh, I'm verse 26, when God calls you from the human point of view, few of you were you wish were wise or powerful or of high social standing. God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise, and he chose what the world considers weak in, in order to shame the powerful. So, if you want to be on God's side, do you have to be wise and powerful? Or does it make you wise and powerful? In Corinthians 3.19, we read, I'll just write you read that quickly, for what this world considers to be wisdom is nonsense in God's sight. As the scripture says, God traps the wise in their cleverness. Um, we don't have time. Well, maybe. This attitude to philosophy does not imply that God, Paul, or Christianity reject logic or reason. On the contrary, reason is one of the most elevated human abilities or attributes God endowed us with when he created humans in his image. What Paul communicates here is that the church or Christian religion is not founded on the presuppositions and the conclusions of philosophy. Uh, Western classical philosophy and recently modern science are based largely on the presuppositions that there is no intentional, loving, special, specific, propositional divine revelation. Wow. Rather, what the Western philosophy and modern science po pose it posit is a human, rational, mystical, and psychological effort to reach toward God or to a certain divine realm. This thinking is a reversal of the Christian faith. Paul adamantly insisted that the church is not and cannot be the product of human philosophy or science or their presuppositions conclusions. So the Bible, the church is not supposed to be a two or three level place where some people are here and some people are here and some people are down there. No, Paul says, I don't care whether you start at the bottom, we're all supposed to be brothers and sisters in the fellowship, a part of the one church. And we're, he's going to go on to say, God is going to build us all up to make that building. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what an incredible promises and propositions are presented here, even just in the first chapter of the book of Ephesus, Ephesians. We don't know exactly the circumstances that Paul was in. He was in prison somehow or other, and yet he was able to write this magnificent stuff because he could see beyond the walls of any prison, and he could see in vision the needs of the people back in Ephesus that he loved, having spent three years with them. Lord, help us to take these words as if they were written just for us and take advantage of them in our Christian lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.